So next up we've got Nick, and he's going to talk about some Kubernetes stuff. Thank you, Nick. Hi, everyone. Uh, sounds like I can hear myself through the fallback, so that's good. Um, excellent. And my slides are up. Fantastic. Everything's going swimmingly so far. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about designing scalable Kubernetes clusters on AWS today. Now, firstly, you probably want to know who the hell am I? Well, I'm a principal engineer at Atlassian. Um, I've uh, been on our Kubernetes team for two years. In fact, I started our Kubernetes team two years ago, um, uh, four and a half years at Atlassian, and about 20 years as a general sysadmin. In that time, I have been a sysadmin, a network engineer, security engineer, uh, help desk person, pretty m most of the things that you could possibly be, I've had a crack at. Um, while I've been at Atlassian, uh, I worked on on-demand. So if you've uh, used uh, Jira or Confluence in the cloud, uh, I probably was working on making sure that the systems that actually ran that uh, stayed up. Um, so yeah, um, and yeah, like it says on the slide, uh, scheduling 150,000 customers worth of JVMs, it's actually pretty hard. Um, on-demand was built on OpenVZ, so we were actually using a super early version of containers um, without a whole bunch of this sort of really nice stuff that the new container schedulers give you. Um, and a couple of years ago, we were in the middle of a tech transition off some hardware onto some other stuff, and we, uh, a couple of us thought, oh, Kubernetes seems really exciting, we need to really check into this and, and see what's going on with this cluster scheduling shenanigans. Um, and so what, what we decided we wanted to build was a set of clusters that could run basically all the compute that we wanted to run at Atlassian. So um, that means that, yeah, we got to solve the, uh, stateful, the stateful storage problem at some point. However, we very cunningly said, to start with, uh, nah, too bad, you don't, you don't get to persist state inside the cluster. All the state get, needs to be persisted outside the cluster to just make that problem go away for now uh, until the uh, open source stuff can catch up. So the, the rule that we have that made this design that I'm about to talk about a lot easier is that uh, we're, we get, um, we're running basically 12-factor apps, stateless 12-factor apps mainly. Um, that was the, the point of, that we were designing towards and persisting everything out to AWS, because we run on AWS. So when, once we started thinking about the design, though, um, I uh, went back to my rule zero of designing scalable stuff, design out the problems that you know about so that you can find all the new and interesting ones later. Um, the, in this case, we picked a few problems and uh, really sort of tried to nail, out, nail down that those problems would not come back to bite us in the ass like they had many times before, um, especially running uh, on demand. There are a whole bunch of problems, all the stuff that Elizabeth was talking about. Uh, you know, we certainly got bitten by all of that stuff at one point or another. And because basically most of the team that was running on demand was going to pick up and move on to Kubernetes, we all had very strong opinions over uh, the stuff that we should and shouldn't be doing. So the problems we decided to solve, the first one was that we wanted to manage the blast radius of changes and make it easy to make changes in smaller chunks. So, to do that, we built a layer cake, sort of trying to mirror things like the OSI model and stuff like that, where there's clearly defined layers with clearly defined demarcation points between them, um, and having nice strong isolation between those layers to make it both easy to work on each, each layer and easy to deploy each layer. Uh, the next one we did was we wanted to go down this immutable infrastructure path as hard and as, and as long as we could. Um, uh, I'll get to exactly how that went in a bit, um, but yeah, it seemed like, based on what we'd done on on-demand, where we were actually running, all of the containers that we ran on on-demand were running with a read-only prototype for the operating system that, you, that was mounted via NFS, so you could swap it out and upgrade to a new version just by rebooting the container. Um, and so we wanted to, that worked astoundingly well, and so we wanted to keep that sort of idea rolling in this new platform. And lastly, because we wanted, we were gonna manage, because we were gonna have everything running on the cluster as much as possible, we really need to be careful about our dependencies. And this is something that if you are planning on going to this cloud native sort of thing, you've got to be really careful about. Because everyone wants to sell you stuff that's going to run on Kubernetes, but if your platform depends on the stuff that's running on it, then you are in for a bad time if it ever goes down. A very bad time. Um, so we wanted to be really careful to sort of build around this stuff right from the very start. Uh, and so the rule that I came up with was we'll only depend on AWS primitives since we're running on AWS. Uh, I'll get to exactly what that meant later. To go back to the layer cake, though, um, oh, before, I, before I get to this, there's one thing that I forgot to explain. Uh, the name of the team is the Kubernetes Infrastructure Technology Team. Now, there's a completely redundant T in there whose own sole purpose is to make it 
so that I could make everything Knight Rider themed for the um, things. Uh, so yeah, the first, uh, the first layer in the layer cake is called the flag. This is a very obscure Knight Rider reference, so I don't, I don't blame you if you don't get it. Um, but yeah, this just includes the base AWS config, VPC, subnets, most of the administrative controls, including security groups. In the one that we do here that's the least sort of administrative is putting in the virtual gateways that connect the VPC up to the rest of our WAN. The one where most of the magic happens is the car, which is probably more familiar to you. Yes, thank you. Excellent to hear that other people are as old as me. Um, uh, so this contains all of the compute, the control plane, the etcd servers that actually do persist the cluster state. Um, but the hard rule that I wanted to have here is that this stands up the, the Kubernetes API server endpoint and nothing else. There's no config port into the, into the Kubernetes cluster here. It's just the API server, the absolute minimal amount of shit that we can do to bring up the API server. Because then, in Goliath, uh, that has all the configuration that actually runs inside Kubernetes, which includes all the role-based access control, security stuff, that actually lets you schedule things onto the cluster. Now, there's a few things, there's a few things that uh, here that are a bit uh, tricky in that uh, to auth to, cu to cube, uh, we've settled on using uh, SSL certs. So we SSL everywhere. Everything is SSL. Everything that talks to anything else across the network is SSL. Um, so the, when you talk to the cluster, the way that you auth is that we issue you a six hour uh, SSL cert. Thanks to Dave Cheney for uh, writing the utility that lets us do that. Um, the, so, you know, and that authenticates you with the CN for the cert and, the, and a group. When you, when the services talk to other services, they get their own SSL certs. Practically what that means is that we've got a shitload of SSL certs we've got to manage, right? And a, private, and a CA for each, for each environment. So um, that made it much harder when it came to storing stuff, which I'll get to when I talk about secrets later. In terms of immutable infrastructure, though, what, uh, what we found was that, for Kubernetes at least, the base workload servers, um, the, all of the worker nodes, they're built around this idea of idempotent microservices that you can just shoot in the head at any time. And so the controllers themselves, which is what runs the actual control plane, and the worker nodes, which run the actual workload, um, they're super easy to build in this immutable infrastructure way. And we, we run CoreOS container Linux machines because they knew nothing else other than run uh, containers, and so there's no point running a f an even bigger OS. Uh, and so we create them in ASGs, they build themselves they pull down any stuff they need, run the, grab the containers they need, and come up. And so when we do a Kubernetes version upgrade, we tick a couple of variables up in a Terraform file, apply the Terraform to the cluster, and then about five minutes later, the, the controllers will have upgraded themselves. For the worker nodes, we like to be a little bit more forgiving to the workloads that are running on the cluster and not just arbitrarily execute them at random times. Um, and so we, we take a little bit of time to cycle them out a bit slower. Um, and, some, and also sometimes we'll leave that in the hands of the autoscaler that so, brings the size of the cluster up and down. It, it executes the old ones, the old nodes first, so over time the new config versions will roll out. However, the et cetera D servers are the tricky part of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you get all this great win of uh, having all these stateless nodes running, but the way you get that is by pushing all the state off to the et cetera D servers. And so you have the classic database problem, except you have it even more so because now it's a distributed database with running a consensus protocol, which everyone knows is awesome fun times to run. So you've got to, you basically can do nothing, almost nothing automatedly to those things without being ridiculously careful and having hundreds of safeguards around everything. At one stage, I actually, so the, so like, like I said here, um, I like to think of the Etcetra D services as milk cows you know the names of, right? Like, they're kind of cattle, but they're a little bit petty, you know, in that, you know, if, you, if one gets sick, you're going to try and help it out a bit. But there's a real limit to how far you're going to go before you're like, look, I'm sorry, you're beef now. Off you go. I'm getting a new one. Um, and so what, and what I found is that that process is fine, but bringing up the new server and rotate for the et cetera D ones and rotating them is a nightmarish ordeal. And so at one stage I wrote, you know, I had to write the typical prototype bash script to figure out how to automate this. And it was like, I don't know, 150 lines of bash or something, of which three were actual commands that did things, and the rest of it was tests to make sure that 
you know, I wouldn't accidentally shoot myself in the foot and destroy the consensus of the cluster and have to throw the whole thing away. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but so the advantage of doing all of this is that because so much of the workload of the cluster is idempotent and throwaway, um, we can actually burn down the whole cluster all the way to the flag and rebuild it again in 30 minutes. So the, the timeline for any severe, oh my god, the world is burning outage is 30 minutes. It, like, we can recover from that in 30 minutes just by saying, nope, deleted, bring it all down, put it all back up. OK, we've got a new cluster ready for you to go. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the things that has been a massive win for us. We haven't actually had to push that button yet, but the fact that it's there is very comforting, I've got to say. Um, and so to talk about the managing dependencies a bit and go back to the secrets, um, we store the, we looked into a whole bunch of different like software packages and stuff and different ways of causing, uh, of storing secrets. Um, but the, the ways that, uh, the thing that made the most sense in the end was just pushing the things into private S3 buckets. Because we run on AWS, you've got IAM roles and all of sort of the usual AWS magic to, to lock that stuff down so that only us and the nodes can get to them. So that means that we have like a CA, a CA private key stored in a private S3 bucket that only a very small number of things have access to. But then we have another bucket that's a bit more open that all the nodes have access to to pull down their public keys or their private keys and their public keys. Um, and that sort of stuff. So it just makes the certificate management problem a tractable one. It's not easy, but it's tractable. Um, and so the, and, but the thing that was important to hear with the dependencies was that it has to be in S3 because we can't push this anywhere that's not in AWS because we're running on AWS. Our, our risk profile is that if AWS ever goes down, we're like, well, we're proper fucked anyway. It doesn't really matter. We don't need to protect against AWS going down at this point because if an AWS region goes down, then probably we really should be out field stripping our AK-47s anyway. Um, you know, something that is going to take down an AWS region at this point is so bad as to be no one gives a shit about your business anymore. Um, so the but the the other dependency that is that was claim close to shooting us a few times is image storage. I mean, you've got all these shiny containers that need to pull down the, the container that they want to run from somewhere, and a lot of the time, they're going to have proprietary stuff in them that you don't want everybody in the world to see. So you can't check them into like the Docker repo or key.io if you're using Rocket or whatever. You know, you've got to run your own private one. So of course, we run our own, Atlassian runs our own private Docker repo, but what happens if we need to restart our stuff and that Docker repo that might end up running on top of our platform is down? We'd be Proper fucked again. So what we're gonna so what we did is we push everything to that Docker, Docker repo, but we also push it to AWS as one because again, if AWS is down, then everything is pear shaped anyway. So it's just what the, the sort of the point that I'm trying to make here is when you're building this sort of stuff, just try to think really carefully about your pen, dependencies. You want to have a directed acyclic graph of dependencies, because if you have the cycles, you are in for a bad time. So but so overall, though, um, how do we do? I'm pretty happy. Um, our cluster scale pretty well. Um, the biggest size so far is about 300 M4 10x larges, which is 12,000 VPS CPUs and 48 terabytes of RAM. Um, and that all happened completely silently um, one Saturday. Uh, and we came in and went, hey, that cluster got pretty fucking big over the weekend. What happened there? Oh, it turns out that uh, Jira Cloud moved all their builds over. And so on Saturday, everyone in Gdansk finished and said, weekend builds, please. Boop. I'll have 2,000 containers scheduled within 10 minutes. Um, and so the cluster recovered. Everything went fine. There were no outages. Uh, and it scaled up to 300, 300 nodes and then scaled slowly back down again. Um, yeah, so yeah. I mean, I'm sure Jeff Bezos was very happy with me about that one. But uh, you know, the, the plus side is there were no outages. And that's, this is the first thing I've ever worked on where we could absorb that sort of usage hit and never have a big problem. And the reason for that is that right now, most of the workloads we're running are batch workloads. These are the pathologically easiest workloads to run on something like Kubernetes because they run to completion and then you throw them away. That is the easiest workload to run on this sort of cluster scheduler. And so we run about 15 to 20K builds in day, in, per day internally. Uh, I, haven't, I couldn't get the numbers before I f did this talk from Bitbucket Pipelines, but if you've used Bitbucket, if you've used their Pipelines feature, um, it actually runs on our Kubernetes clusters today, right now. Um, and so that one, those ones are particularly interesting because those, when the point of your product is to run arbitrary code provided by random people on the internet, you have a very different security profile than when you're running stuff from inside. Uh, and so where to next? 
Um, I have been starting to evaluate this whole service mesh shenanigans um, to, because our service workloads are coming and they're like, hey, we've heard about these service meshes. You know about cluster of stuff. Should we be using it? And I'm like, I don't know. I guess I better check it out. Um, but yeah, initial things are, it's very interesting, but it's very early. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for your time, everybody. Um, I'm pretty sure if there is no time for questions, then I am more than happy to be grabbed on the hallway track at any time. I have many things to say. Thanks very much.